It's all about 
Good morning, folks. have something very special about to take place this morning. Water baptism, one of the most important things that you can do as a Christian. An outward sign of an inward work in you. We have five candidates for baptism this morning, and uh, they are going to be blessed, and I know that you will also just by being part of this. And first of all, we have Caden Gann. Is the water cold, Caden? <laughs> have you, Caden, before you're baptized, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You know him in the full pardon of your sin. And you're about to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Pastor Chris. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Who we got next to? Landon. Okay. Landon Gann. We're doing the whole Gann family today. <laughs> Landon, do you acknowledge that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and he's pardoned you from all your sin, and you're ready to go to heaven? Ready to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Amen. That is wonderful. Madden Gann, okay. Hey, Madden, can you, can you see me, Madden? Can you see me over here? Can you see me? You've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, ready to go to heaven, ready to be baptized. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Chris gave him an option of either being first or last, and he said he wanted to be third. <laughs> so, so <laughs> Melissa again. Oh, that's refreshing, isn't it? <laughs> Melissa. You've accepted, Je <laughs> you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Our sins are gone. Ready to go to heaven. Ready to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Brandy Mitchell. Hey, Brandy, let me ask you something. You know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? You ready to go to heaven? All your sins are gone. And you're going to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. 
<laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Thank you, pastors. I'm sure that water was pleasant. <laughs> I'll tell you, that is a wonderful thing to be part of. And a lot of funny stories about water baptism, but I'm not going to get into that. It's good to have you here with us this morning. Uh, Pastor Mark called me this morning. I think he thought I was still asleep, but uh, I'm not a late sleeper. We were up actually uh, going to have some coffee and do our devotion and have prayer. And uh, I got a phone call. <laughs> he said he's a, little, he's a little under the weather. And I know he has to feel mighty bad or he would be here. And he doesn't want anybody else to get uh, what he has. But uh, I appreciate the opportunity to get to share the Word of God with you this morning. Um, it's always a privilege, but it's also a, a great responsibility. I'm responsible for what I say, and I'll be held accountable for everything that I say to you here today. So I'm going to do my best not to get anything wrong, and I don't believe that I will. But if you have your Bibles and want to open them with me, uh, over into the Old Testament book of 2 Kings. I want to talk about one of my favorite people, or a little bit about him. 2 Kings chapter 5. If I could get you to stand with me this morning for the reading of the Word of God, standing in reverence to His Word. You know, this is something special. Everybody doesn't have the opportunity to do this. 2 Kings chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He, also, he was also a mighty man in valor, but was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by, by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of, of Syria said, Go to. And I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have sent thee Naaman, my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive? that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel with me. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and, and with his chariot, and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and the flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth, and went away, and said, Behold, I thought, he will surely come out to me, and stand, and call on the name of the Lord his God, and strike his hand over the place, and recover the leper. Are not... Abana and Farpar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel, that I may not wash in them and be clean. So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God and all his company, and came and stood before him and said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel, 
Now therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. But he said, As the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. And I'm going to stop right there. I want to ask you to bow your heads with me. And let's pray and ask God to do what he wants to do this morning. Father God in heaven, we come in the holy, divine name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one who loved us and gave himself for us. Lord, we come in humility this morning, asking you to pour out upon us your word and your spirit. God, I pray that there would, there would be nothing in my speech today that would impede the word of God. I pray that I would do no violence or harm to your word, but I would speak only what thus saith God. God, I ask you to minister to everyone here today, from the oldest to the least, to the greatest to the youngest, every single one. Minister to us, Lord, by your Spirit, through your word, and God will give you the praise in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. And God bless you. You may be seated. For just a little while this morning, I want to talk about a subject that is very simple, and that is doing what you are asked to do. Doing what you are asked to do. How many times in our lives, now think about this, how many times in our lives would it have been just so simple if we had done what we were asked to do? <laughs> Wouldn't that have made life better, especially growing up? Man, our, you know, our parents ask us to do something rather than telling us to do it. And did we do it? Probably not. We, uh, we took the option and we did what we wanted to do. And it seems that we humans are never simply able to just do what we're told to do. I think it, that's why I think it's good for every young man to go into the military. Uh, I know it's an eye-opening experience when you're used to doing whatever you want to do, and then all of a sudden you're being told everything to do. Wouldn't it make marriage simple if we just did what we were told to do? Men? <laughs> I, got, I got a friend I worked with for a long time. His name is B.J. Williams, wonderful man of God. But he told me one day, he said, he said I used to have a lot of trouble at my house with my wife. I said, well, BJ, what did you do to change it? He said, well, I never have any trouble now. I said, well, what did you do? He said, I just started doing everything that she tells me to do. Good advice. Right, Clifford? <laughs> That's advice you can't go wrong with. Most of the time, we have our reasons, don't we, for not doing what we're asked to do or what we are told to do, whichever applies. And these reasons that we give reveal a lot to us and to others about what makes us tick. We've got reasons. The same thing was true for this great man named Naaman. He was, he was a great man. He had a problem, and he sought help. But then when the help came, he refused what, to do what was asked of him. Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? You know, back before GPSs, husbands were known to drive all over creation looking for something rather than stopping and asking for directions. While the wife is saying, pull over and ask somebody. And no matter how much they fussed, we wouldn't pull over. But this man, Naaman, being a, a great man, had a lot to learn about God just like all of us do. And by looking at this one incident in the book of 2 Kings, we can see how that it is far simpler when dealing with God when we are just doing what we're asked to do. Now, that gets me to this. Let me this morning give you some facts that give insight into the ways of God when it comes to the thing of doing what you're asked to do. Fact number one, God is not interested in our credentials. God's not interested in our credentials. You know, now we have as many doctors preaching as we do reverends and pastors. That amazes me. 
I cannot think of a, sing, a single higher calling in the world than to be called into the ministry to preach the Word, word of God. What could, be, what could be better than that? What could be of greater value than that? When you're seeing people brought into the kingdom of God by what you're preaching, and that is the true unadulterated Word of God. What an awesome responsibility to stand behind this pulpit. And I know that Pastor Mark does not ever take that lightly. I've heard him preach too many times. But God is not impressed with our credentials. We allow ourselves to be swayed by the world, to believe that a, a piece of paper hanging on the wall means a whole lot more than it really does. I've heard some people that had every kind of degree and, and, and schooling and whatever that you could possibly ever want, and they couldn't get their point across. And I've heard simple, uneducated people preach, and it has clicked with people. Well, P Brother Turley, are you against education? No, I'm not, not in any way. I think we need, it all, we need, it all, we need all that we can get. But we need more God than we need books. I think we need a little more neology than we need theology. In other words, we need to be in touch with the one who gave us this. This is, this is what feeds us. This is what sustains us. It's not something that we've done or a place that we've been or, or even who we know or who we're friends with. But we allow ourselves to be swayed by the world to believe that something is worth more than it is. This man named Naaman, he was a great man. He was captain of the host of Syria. He had won great military victories, great victories in battle. And he didn't realize that God had already settled these battles in heaven before they were ever fought on earth. Every great battle or every small battle that has ever been fought in this world's history has already been decided in the heavenlies before it's ever fought here. We humans get to thinking that we have a, a hand in what happens, but that's not the way that it is. God and His ministering spirits, angels, are orchestrating every single thing that happens in this world, and we just happen to be here. This man, Naaman, was a great man, and he was used to everybody doing what he said. You ever been in that position where you jump and somebody says, How high? Some people really like that. Sometimes it goes to their head. We sometimes forget. We forget that Jesus chose people to carry his gospel that today would never ever be considered for ministry. They didn't look the part. They didn't act the part. They couldn't sing or play music, which, by the way, neither do I. I've, had, I've pastored two churches for over 25 years. None, neither one of them would let me sing. I don't understand why. But we forget that the people that Jesus chose were just ordinary people. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, it says this, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. And they took knowledge of them. What did they take knowledge of them? That they had been with Jesus. When somebody's been with Jesus, you don't need anything hanging on the wall. When somebody's been with Jesus, you don't have to put up a big billboard saying how, oh, this big Holy Ghost preacher is going to come and tell you how to get right. You don't need all that. People know when you've been in the presence of God. People know when you read the Word of God. People know when you act like a follower of the Son of God. You don't have to broadcast it. Now, God is not impressed with our credentials, but God is impressed by our faith. You want to you impress God? Have faith in God. I remember a centurion in Matthew. Matthew chapter 8. A centurion came to Jesus. He said, I've got somebody back at the house. They're sick. They're going to die. I need you to intervene. And Jesus said, okay, I'll go with you. He said, you don't have to do that. You don't have to go. I'm not worthy for you to even come into my house. All you have to do is speak the word and they'll be healed. That is faith. 
That is faith. Jesus marveled at the faith of the centurion. Two times in the Word of God that it says that Jesus marveled. One time was about unbelief. But the other time that he marveled or was astounded was by the faith of the centurion. So if you want to impress God, don't worry about the credentials. Just get your faith in order. This says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Want to increase your faith? Get in this Word. Read it. Study it. Meditate on it. Think about it. Say it out loud. And it will change your life. In the case of Naaman, his credentials as the captain of the host of Syria was a great source of pride. Now let me tell you something. Never, ever, you ought to write this down. Never, ever let what you have accomplished with the ability or the talent that God has given you, never let it be a source of pride. You may be the most gifted speaker or, or whatever in the world, but God gave you that ability. It wasn't something that you just churned up. It wasn't something that you just came up with. God gave you that talent or that ability. Never let it be a source of pride to you. Our society may be credential crazy, but our God is not. That was fact number one. Fact number two is this. God will never ask you to do the impossible. He can't. Because with God, all things are possible. God will never ask you to do anything that He doesn't enable you and empower you to accomplish. You say, well, I can't do that. Yes, you can. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Last thing I ever wanted to be was a preacher or a pastor. Absolute last thing. I was the biggest preacher critic in the world. I thought most of them were phonies. Some are. I thought most of them had no idea what they were talking about. When here's a man that's never had a job in his life telling me how I need to conduct myself on my job. I didn't understand that. So the last thing I ever wanted to be was a pastor. And the Sunday evening at camp meeting, when Brother Floyd Lahan called me out, and prayed for me. I'd asked God for, for a special miracle so I could never doubt my calling. But God did it, and all I could say was, Lord, you'll have to help me. You'll have to help me. And He always has. God had not asked Naaman to do anything that was impossible. God, through the prophet, had simply said to him, or actually, He sent a servant out to him and said, Go and dip in the river Jordan seven times. Well, how simple is that? That's so easy a caveman could do it, right? How simple is that? But boy, did he, did, did he hit a nerve. What nerve did it? He hit that old big pride nerve. All of us have got one, don't we? Oh, we've got it. We have got it. This was extremely difficult for Naaman because of his pride. So what does he do? Well, he, he immediately points out, the rivers in his home are cleaner, they're bigger, they've got to be better than this little muddy river Jordan, and you want me to dip in that seven times and be clean? But it was pride. I've never known anybody that has choked to death on pride, but I know some that have come mighty close, and I'm one of them. Oh, that pride will do things to you. Pride will do things to you. 1981, I got saved in January. Ten days later, I had my back broken in a hunting accident. I was flat on my back for eight weeks. I got up three times a week, and that was to go to church. I lived out in the country, and I had a well and a pump, a jet pump. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Got a foot valve down at the bottom, two lines that go down to it. And sometimes that 
foot valve would get stuck and I'd have to pull it out and it was about 120 feet of pipe full of water. I'd do it by myself. Well, two weeks after my back was broken, the well pump quit. And I had to ask for help. <laughs> you talk about nearly choking to death on pride. So I got father-in-law and two brothers and they came up and while they pulled the foot valve out of the well I stood in the yard with my back brace on and cried because of that pride let me tell you something pride is not a good thing in that kind of condition pride causes you to do things that you don't really want to do I nearly choked to death on my pride. But you know what? God's figured out a way to keep me humble. And he keeps on and keeps on and keeps on keeping me humble. God will never ask you to do anything that is impossible. But he will always enable you and empower you to accomplish that. And you might need to write this down. God is more concerned with us doing the little things in life for Him every day than doing some great thing. Every pastor is not going to go out here and build a big cathedral that will seat 10,000 people and have a campus in every nearby town. Everybody's not going to do that. But let me tell you something. That pastor that's t pastoring 6 or 8 or 10 or 12, is doing just as valuable a work because he is working where God has put him. He's changing lives. God's more concerned about you doing the everyday things in your life. He'll never ask you to do the impossible. Fact number three is this. You cannot buy the blessings of God. Amen. I'll say it for you. Naaman had come with a tremendous amount of money. Now, don't, don't you know doctors today would love that? You drive up, and man, you've, got, you've just got truckloads of money with you. I can, they'll be lined up wanting to treat you. They could actually pay their medical insurance for a couple of months with that money. But Naaman brought a tremendous amount of cash with him, seeking his healing. He had a, something a whole lot better than Blue Cross Blue Shield. He had hard cash. And that's what he thought it was going to take for him to be healed. He didn't understand that God heals for no charge. Has God ever sent you a bill for healing you? I know some of you here have been healed by the hand of God. Some of you had the faith one day to believe that by His stripes you were healed. And all of a sudden, you don't know how it happened. You don't know what God did. But all of a sudden, you realize that God had touched you and you had been made whole. And God never sent you a bill. Isn't that amazing? Some of our televangelists haven't, they haven't got that message yet. It's all about, oh, you know, if you'll send us that money, then we'll pray for you. Let me, let me say one little quick thing about that. When that guy on TV asks you for the money and then you get sick and you're in the hospital or you lose a loved one, is he going to be there for you? No, but that local pastor is. Mark Gidley is going to be there for you. Come on. You know I'm telling you the truth. He's going to be there. He drove umpteen miles down to my brother's funeral in January. Long, long way, and he only had a limited time to get there, but he, he showed up. But that's what pastors do. That's what they do. Not because they're, they're trying to win accolades or anything, but it's because the Spirit of God moves them to do that. And sometimes I think that People that do these things are getting more and more scarce. But let me tell you something about buying the blessings of God. Any attempt 
to buy the blessing of God is an insult to God. That's all you can say about it. It's an insult. And it demonstrates the ignorance of the person that is trying to do this. You can't buy God's blessing. Well, well, preacher, how do I get them? Very, very simple. And you can write this one on the wall too. The blessings of God are now and have always been found on the path of obedience. If you want God to bless you, get in obedience to His Word. If you want God to pour out His Spirit and His blessings upon you, get in obedience to His Word. Find out what this says and then get in line with it. I don't care what the world is telling us we need to do. This is what we need to do. There, this is what we're going to be judged by. This, on Judgment Day, when we stand before the Lord, yes, we as Christians will stand before the, the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ, and we will give an account of the things done in the body since the day we got saved. All those other things are gone. We'll give an account. Naaman tried to buy the blessing, but when he finally got obedient, he was healed. He was cleansed. Have you ever noticed in the Bible, nobody that ever had leprosy, it doesn't say that they were healed. It says that they were cleansed. Isn't that amazing how God chooses those words? But that gets me to this point. How many of us today are not healed because we are not obedient? Uh-oh. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. How many of us are not healed because we are not obedient? I have seen some miraculous things in the years I've been preaching. And it never fails to amaze me. I've seen people that... I had one church member, the doctors told him he was going blind. His son and daughter-in-law had been married at that time for about, about five years. Doctors told him he would be blind within six months. And the Spirit of God moved one Sunday morning. I'll never forget it. And I called him up for prayer. His name is Kenny Clark. If you've ever, if you've ever been to a Stanley Owensby revival, Kenny and Renee Clark were there playing music. And I said, Kenny, God said He's going to heal your eyes because He wants you to be able to see those grandbabies. And man, the place just erupted because everybody knew this couple was childless. Well, guess what? After 15 years of marriage, they had their first little boy. Shortly thereafter, they had another little boy. And Kenny's not blind, but he sees those grandbabies every day. See what God can do if we get in obedience to Him? James tells us, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, not sins, and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You know, you ought, to, you ought to get your Strong's Concordance out one day and look up that word fervent. You know what it means? It means boiling. Boiling. The effectual boiling prayer, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In other words, get down to business with God and just see what God will do. I'll tell you something else. It's rare to find a church nowadays where they actually have anointing oil. In a church of God, absolutely. 
Why do we anoint with oil? Oil is a symbol of the Holy Ghost. We anoint with oil. We lay hands on the sick. This is, this is the formula that God has given us for people to be healed. So when we are not obedient, why do we expect to be healed? But going back to what I said earlier, you can't buy the blessings of God. It's simply by getting in obedience. Fact number four that I want to share with you this morning. You'll like this one. God doesn't always do things like we think He should. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. We get it in our beady little brain how we want God to fix something, how we want Him to fix this family or this person that we're focused on. They need God, and we've got it all worked out in our mind. We know exactly how we want God to do it, and none of that happens. None of it happens. <laughs> Why would I say that in, in this passage? Well, because Naaman, this great man, said, Behold, I thought. I, he thought too. He said, I thought he would come out here and put his hand over the place and pray for me and invoke the name of his God and I would be healed. See, he, he had it worked out in his mind. So that loved one that you've been praying for for so long, that child that has been astray for so long and it seems like nothing can ever get a hold of them, don't give up. Just trust God and God will bring them to a place of repentance and they'll get where they need to be if you'll just trust Him and get in obedience to Him. We don't have to figure out the ways. We don't figure out who God's going to use. Because God might use somebody that you would never, ever dream that He would use. And He might even use you to reach somebody else. But that's what we do. We have it all figured out. This man, Naaman, went all the way to Israel. All the way to Israel to see the doctor. And the doctor wouldn't see him. Isn't, isn't that the way it goes? Isn't, isn't it amazing when we, we try to see a doctor today? We, we've got something that we think is really, really serious. And we go to him on Friday. And they do all these tests. And we're really concerned or we wouldn't be there. And then they say, well, we'll have the results next week. So we have to sweat it. We have to wait. This man went all the way to Israel to see the doctor, and the doctor wouldn't see him. We plan it, and we want God to do it. Isn't that the way we do? You know I'm telling you the truth this morning. So let me sum this up for you. Now, unlike your pastor, I'm going to have one closing. <laughs> We laugh every week. I'll elbow Kim or she'll elbow me and say, that's one. <laughs> He's got too much to say. <laughs> oh, my. But let me sum this up for you. God is not impressed with our earthly credentials. God will never ask you to do the impossible. You cannot buy the blessings of God. And lastly, God doesn't always do things like we think that He should. God may even want you to do some small thing in order to be blessed. But you think you have to do some great thing. That's not true. Learn a lesson from this, this story of Naaman. Get in obedience in the little things. And then God might use you in some great thing. Don't think that God's just going to give you one great big thing to do before you've been proven in some little things. It doesn't happen that way. We don't do that when we hire somebody to do a job. We find out what they can do and how 
faithful they are in doing it and how well they do it. And then we start giving them more and more. Why would God be any different? I remember a word from an old song we used to sing. It said, God will only use the soldier he can trust. Keep on the firing line. Wow. If you win the crown and bear the cross, you must keep on the firing line. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Learn this lesson. God's not asking you to do any great, great big thing today. He's just asking you to come as you are and follow Him. And if there's something in you that needs to be changed, He'll change it. It's not up to, up to Uncle Joe or anybody else to tell you what you need to change. God will take care of that. Boy, we used to, we think we had to get them in the church of God. We'd, first thing we had to do was get them cleaned up. God will take care of that. He'll take care of it. If you'll just get right in obedience in the little things. Now, I want to ask you to close your eyes for just a moment and think about this. Has God given you something to do? Has God prompted you or quickened your spirit to do some little thing for somebody and you haven't done it? It may be sending a card to somebody sick or preparing a meal for somebody that's not able. Or maybe helping somebody with a bill that they're not able to pay. Some little thing. God hasn't called you yet to build a great big church dynasty somewhere. But He wants you to get in submission to Him and in obedience to Him. And as soon as you do that, He will begin to pour out more blessing than you can contain. See if He won't open the windows of heaven and pour out on you more than you can hold. If you'll just get in obedience. And God will do more than you ever thought that He would do. Father, let Your Word quicken us. Let it go forth as a sharp two-edged sword. So sharp, Lord that it can differentiate between the soul and spirit so quick and sharp and powerful. There's nothing like it anymore in the name of Jesus. Would you stand with me this morning? You know, you always, when you're preaching, you always wonder what God's going to do or how you want to close a service. So what I want to do this morning, I want to ask you once, once again, bow your heads with me. And I'm going to ask you personally, I'm going to confront you with this. Am I doing everything that God wants me to do? Am I helping the widow? Am I taking care of the orphan? Am I supporting missionaries? Am I loving my neighbor as myself? All of these things are acts of obedience. Am I forsaking the assembling of myself at church as we're commanded to do? Are you in obedience to Him? You know, there's nobody looking around. Nobody can see you except God. If you're here this morning and you're willing to say, I'm not in complete obedience to God, but God, I need you to help me. Show me what you want. And if you'll just slip your hand up to acknowledge that. I see that hand. I see that hand, yes. Thank you, Lord, for these hands. Thank you for these hands. And now I want you to pray with me. 
whether you raised your hand or not. Father God in heaven, I want you, Lord, to show me exactly what you want me to do. Show me in a way that I can never doubt. Help me, Lord, to get in obedience to you. For I know that there I'll find blessing. In the name of Jesus, I believe it. Amen and amen. Get in obedience. Now, I would feel, I just wouldn't feel right if I didn't give you an opportunity. If you need prayer this morning, we'd be glad to pray with you. We've got people that will stand in the gap and pray with you and for you. If you've got a, a physical need, a financial need, a spiritual need, somebody you really want to see get saved, or you just need a touch in your body, come on and let's pray. Come on. We don't have to, we don't have, to have a, you know, a band blaring. And, you know, and let me say this before I forget it. God bless these musicians and singers here. I'm telling you, you folks are blessed. But all it takes is an humble, contrite spirit and, and you willing to come forward and say, Brother Turley, I need, I need something from God this morning and I want God to touch me. Maybe you've gone as far as you can go. Maybe you've got something that's just driving you out of your mind. And you need help with it. Come on. Let the Lord help you. Come on. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. This is what obedience is all about. It's what obedience is all about. You have to start somewhere.